Hello everybody, and welcome to a brand new Dungeon Dad Campaign Diary. Before we begin, however, I would like to show you something that I found very interesting. Did you know that in the second edition Monstrous Manual, the artwork for the Invisible Stalker is in fact just a blank square? Isn't that just incredible? That is what D&D is lacking nowadays, is this kind of ballsy ass move to just leave it as a blank square because it's invisible. Anyways, uh, yeah, let's do it. So we are on the latest part of the epic Weavers of Destruction saga, which if you're not familiar with what this is, basically these are just videos where I talk about my personal D&D game and what's happening in that world. Hopefully you can draw inspiration from some of the things I talk about, ridicule my horrible DMing decisions, or otherwise just talk about things you find interesting. This is a continuous series, so if you haven't watched the previous videos, you may not have as big of a grasp on what's going on, but I'll try to explain things best I can, so... Let's get into it. In the last video, I talked about how the party just finished things up with the orcs and Phragius, and we're getting ready to go back to Barum so that Mona could collect her debt. Or I guess collect the debt owed to her for services rendered as an assassin. So onward they went across the massive desert that they had just come from back to the Yawning Portal, which was kind of their meeting point at the halfway mark to Barum. Now this was kind of a scary situation for me to be in as a DM, and this is something, if you haven't experienced it already, you probably will experience it at some point, where essentially the party had no quest or drive to really do anything. Once Mona had tied up her business in Barum, which the party agreed to accompany her on, they there was nothing else for them to do. That was the first arc of this campaign, and while I had other plans for adventure, there were no active plot hooks. Which, like I said, can be kind of scary because it, you don't want the game to become boring if the players don't feel like they have a goal, right? Um, so that puts a little bit of pressure on you as a DM because basically from where I'm at, that means that between Mona collecting her money or immediately after it and, um, where they're at right now on the road going there, something has to happen. Something has to change and they have to get a new plot hook. But as scary as that can be sometimes, it's also kind of nice because then you get to start a whole new adventure. And that's exactly what this is. This was essentially the second chapter in the Weavers of Destruction campaign setting. And a lot of these guys didn't know where that was going to lead. So I had a few ideas for things I wanted to do and how I wanted the plot to progress and what kind of story hooks I was going to give them. But first they had to get to Barum, and that was kind of the current goal. And this ended up taking us, I think, three sessions or maybe two separate sessions, and they were about five to six hour sessions. So back to where the party's currently at. They traveled across the desert, they made their way across the entire desert, which is like a week and a half's worth of travel without a single encounter, which was totally fine. They stopped at the Yawning Portal, they saw Durnum, they spent a night there, kind of reconnected with him and had a drink. That was fine. The party was telling him the tale of how they liberated this orcish people, and it was good. So the distance from the Yawning Portal to where Barum is in, on the map in my world is about another week-ish. But it is on a road instead of just across the open desert, so it's a lot safer. So we thought. While traveling on the road, the party came across a difficult encounter which caught them by surprise, and uh, what I rolled on the random table was a pod demon. Now some of you watching have probably seen my Monster of the Week video where I talked about the pod demon, which was like nine months ago if I had to guess. And basically they came across a pod demon looting an overturned wagon with some of its little podling minions kind of around it, and there was a couple dead bodies that they could see. Dwarvish merchants by the look of it. So Felden, the paladin of course, sprang into action and the rest of the party followed suit, and uh, they went through a pretty difficult battle. Fortunately, in the end of things though, they were able to overcome the pod demon and uh, they took it down after a somewhat difficult battle. It did try to escape at one point, but um, are the druid who thinks he's a cleric cast uh, entangling roots or whatever that spell is called, plant growth I think maybe in 5th edition, and they were able to slow him down enough where they could pick him off with spells and arrows. I can't remember which one, one of the bow users, it was either Mona or Karen, managed to shoot him from super far away. I think it must have been Karen because it was a longbow shot and uh, managed to take him down. So they, uh, the body just kind of devolved into caustic goo, which they just left alone. And um, they went to bury the remains of the two dwarves that were on the wagon. 
only to find that there was a third dwarf, a dwarvish child, who was hiding underneath the wagon that had been overturned. So through some questioning, they found out the dwarvish child, her name was Pearl, and those were her parents. She was very upset, of course, but Felden, the paladin, kind of took her under his wing and was like, it's okay, we're going to Barum, that's where you have, she made sure you had, she had family there, she said her grandmother lived there. So they basically took her into their custody until they could get back to town. Also something pretty important to the story that I forgot to mention was that the party passed through Oakhurst again on their way on the road to Barum, and when they were there they stopped and they bought horses for the entire party, they bought a wagon to carry feed for all their horses and some of their other equipment, and then they bought a horse to pull that wagon. So the party at this point is all on horseback, and they had a wagon with them. So getting back to the pod demon encounter, uh, they now had that place for Pearl to stay basically. They put her in the wagon along with some of the resources and stuff that were on her parents' cart. And of course then, ending off that day, they had a funeral for her parents, kind of fell and made them some traditional dwarvish stone headstones out of some rocks that he was able to find, and they buried their remains along the roadside. The reason that's so important to this story is because it was allowing them to travel along the road at one extra hex per day, so they were getting to bear them a little bit faster. Anyways, so after they finished up their first day, they rested for the night close by to where they had the battle actually, and of course they rolled another encounter. This one on the table ended up being a hill giant, which was a semi-difficult encounter for their party's level. They probably could have done it if they chose to fight him, but they didn't because they were still recovering from the last fight, they hadn't had a chance to actually rest for very long at this point. The hill giant just kind of came lumbering in, so they offered him some food to try to kind of cozy up to him, make him a little less hostile. Hill giants are very much driven by food, so he didn't mind that. He accepted the food and was like, oh, do you have more? Do you have more? And they gave him just a bunch of food that they had that they didn't really need too much. So that was good. Um, he was actually getting ready to leave. And at one point, I think it was Tim said something about, because Tim is the only one in the party who could speak giant, so he was kind of communicating with him um, and shaking in his boots as he did so. But Tim said something about, uh, he called him my friend. He was like, oh, see you later, my friend. Like, thank you for stopping by or something like that. And the giant was like, oh, we're, we're friends now? And he like sat back down and the party was like, oh, great, here we go. So that was a fun little role play encounter that they had with this giant. They basically able were able to... Um, keep him in a good mood, they fed him a little bit more, and eventually sent him on his way. So that was fine, no harm, no foul, the party went back to sleep and moved on with their lives. Another couple days of travel later, on the road they encountered two Fomorians, which was another somewhat difficult encounter for them, but um, if you're not familiar with what a Fomorian is, they're basically just twisted, grotesque giants. Imagine a hill giant, but with very like dark purpley skin, very lumpy, lumpy and tumorous, and they have this, they can't throw rocks, but they have an attack called Evil Eye that like twists someone into their image, kind of, which causes a bunch of negative status effects, they're just nasty. So they fought two of those, managed to come out on top, no one died, um, Oriana, the tiefling noble, uh, warlock, she was actually affected by the evil eye ability, which made her very gross and like tumorous and stuff, which she hated because like as a player, she kind of thought it was interesting, but her character, of course, thought that was disgusting. Uh, she failed her save too many times. Fortunately, that curse, you get a new save every time you take a long rest, and that night she managed to shake it off. So again, they came out on top of this encounter. So that was fine. They stopped there, rested for the night, made their way out in the next morning. And they were basically, we were coming to the end of this session at this point. So they were like, let's try to get to Barum, and if we roll another encounter before we know what it is or anything, we'll just call the session, and we'll start out next time with an encounter. That's what we did. They rolled, they rolled, they rolled, they were one day away from getting to Barum, and of course that night someone rolled a 12 on the D12, which is a difficult encounter. I got them to roll to see what it was, I didn't tell them what it was, and then we called the session there, and I said, okay, Moan is on watch, and we'll see what happens at the beginning of the next game. What they had rolled for their encounter was three Dragoloths. If you don't know what a Dragoloth is, they're horrifying. They're basically half Drow Elf, half Glazebru, so they're this like fey demon hybrid thing. They're disgusting. They're super brutal in combat and they're like CR7. And it is not an easy encounter, especially not for a group whose average level is four. Granted, there's three Dragoloths and like six to seven of them, depending on how many people showed up for the next game. So it was somewhat reasonable, but this was definitely going to be a tough encounter for them to overcome. 
So, of course, during the two weeks between these two games, the party's talking about, oh, I wonder what it is, I wonder what's going to happen, but they couldn't strategize for anything because we didn't reveal what they encountered until that game. They just knew it was going to be a tough encounter, and this encounter ended up being a very fateful one for the party, which I think has kind of changed the course of the game as a whole, which is interesting is you never know when that's going to happen, you can't anticipate it, and sometimes it just does work itself out that way. So Dragoloths can cast Darkness as a spell, it's a spell-like ability they have. So the Dragoloths snuck up on them in the night, Mona rolled horribly on her perception check, so she didn't see them at first, and they cast Darkness in f three separate areas, which was big enough to s basically surround the small caravan where they were camping. So it was total darkness, and I basically just described to Mona that everything got really dark all of a sudden. So she, um started kind of looking around and went to wake up the party and as she was doing so one of these dragoloths which are large creatures just kind of came into the darkness area that they had created the only light source being the small campfire that was there and just took a huge chunk out of her with one of its claws so at this point she's screaming everyone's waking up and the dragoloths got their surprise round they attacked a couple party members and then we roll initiative this encounter was so swingy like it was impossible to tell whether the party was going to win or not. The state of affairs seemed to change with every single turn. It was nuts. The damage was being kind of divided up between the party because of how they were moving around and attacking. So it got to a point where the three Dragoloths were all still up with a decent amount of damage on each of them. And everyone in the party was within like 10 hit points of going down except for Felton the Paladin because his AC was so high he wasn't absorbing as many hits as everyone else. Fortunately they were able to break the concentration of all the Dragoloths so the darkness spell was completely gone. And it started to look like they were going to overcome the Dragoloths somewhat easily and take them down. However, on the next turn, one of the Dragoloths used another spell-like ability it has called Confusion. Which literally just casts the Confusion spell on a creature. Actually, now that I think of it, I think it's a radius of 10 or maybe 15 feet. I think it's 10 feet. But anyways, he cast it and he got Atlin the uh, Knight and felled in the Paladin in the same radius. And they both failed their save, which was terrible. If you don't know what confusion does, basically there's a good chance you just do nothing on your turn. There's a small chance that you just run away from in a random direction at your max speed. And there's a slightly smaller chance that you can just act as normal. You roll a d10 to determine what you're able to do on your turn. So like I said, both of those characters failed their saves and they both kept rolling poorly on the d10 and were essentially locked out and did nothing for like three turns in a row. And taking both of them essentially out of combat was just detrimental for the party. Everybody's unconscious, except for Felden and Atlan, who are both confused and struggling to do anything, and Mona, who is still up with like four hit points left. Everyone else is unconscious and making death saving throws. And two of the Dragoloths at this point have been killed. So there's one Dragoloth left, essentially facing off against Mona, while these other two guys are confused, just trying to do anything. And this is where things just kind of went downhill. Um, first, Karen failed all three of her death saving throws in a row and bled out. Then Ren, who was played by Kira, failed all three of his death saving throws and bled out. Tim failed two of his death saving throws and was getting ready to make a third. When on the next initiative turn, Mona was able to kill the Dragoloth and Felden made his way over to him and was able to use Lay on Hands to heal him back up and then Felden went around and healed up everyone else. And that was pretty much it. The party didn't completely wipe, but they lost two members and uh, essentially that came down to the fact that they decided to stay and fight, which granted... It wasn't like it was impossible for them to win, but there was like a 50% chance this was going to happen. And unfortunately, their death saving throws just weren't on their side. If either of them had rolled one success instead of the two, three failures in a row they had, it would have given Felden an extra turn and he would have been able to get to them and heal them. Like it came down to just that one turn. So the party was obviously pretty upset by this. Um, not as not at me, but just in general, because they had two characters die on them. And while they're only at fourth level, getting them resurrected is not an easy proposition. So the party healed their wounded and uh, gathered the two dead characters and put them in the wagon. And basically, they want to resurrect those characters because they're their friends and that's what they want to do. And also, those two players, I think, were enjoying playing those as those characters, so it's kind of a shame that they died. I felt bad. I really liked both of those characters, and um, 
I talked to them both about this afterwards, actually, just to see what they thought. So I was like, I asked them, I was like, would you have wanted me to fudge the roles if it meant you staying alive? And they both said no, that they would rather die fairly than have their characters not have any weight because they were basically being allowed to live by fake dice rolls. And I agree with that, and that's how I DM. I just kind of wanted to see what they thought about the situation, so I was glad to know that they were still enjoying the game, even though this was kind of a sad moment. And of course, you go through the mourning phase where it's upsetting when your character dies, and literally right after this happened, we took like a 20-minute break. We all went in and uh, sat out on the front deck of the house, and we just like smoked a cigar and just like talked about what happened, and um, yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, one of our players had to go, he had another commitment and he had to leave around that time and we were short one player, Oriana wasn't actually there that day because she had something else so she couldn't be there. So there was only like four of them remaining, so we just basically finished up that day's travel, got to Barum, and that's where we ended the session. The session was only like two and a half hours. We just did that combat and then got to Barum, which was just them rolling one last time to see if they got an encounter, which they didn't. They got to Barum. They were rolling up to the front gates with their caravan, and that was where we ended the session. Um, and then the other four of us who were left, like, played the Dark Souls board game, which is a super fun game, by the way. But, uh, yeah, so that was what happened there. And, um, again, we went through that kind of mourning phase with those two players. Um, they both are in the process of making new characters that are going to be introduced into the game when they get into Barum. And they've been coming up with some really interesting character concepts, and it's been pretty exciting, I think. So they're now in that phase where they're excited to be playing their new characters, which inevitably always happens when a character dies. So that's pretty much where the game is at right now. We are caught up in the timeline of the Weavers of Destruction setting. Um, I do want to take a few minutes here, though, and just talk about kind of the aftermath of what resulted immediately from those characters dying. So... I then looked at Akira and Kristen, the two people who play those characters, and I was like, okay, you guys are both in, like, a foggy, white plane of existence. You're standing on the edge of a dock, you're there together, that's all you can see, and basically, Charon, the boatman, came up the river, and was, like, beckoned them onto the boat, and he was like, let's go, and of course, they were like, can I talk to him? I was like, yeah, absolutely. And they asked, like, where are you taking us? Where where does the boat go? And he simply replied, I don't know. I merely operate the boat. I take souls where they're meant to be. I don't know where that is. He's essentially just the, uh, the taxi driver of the afterworld. So Karen then stepped onto the boat. And she was like, okay, I'm ready. Like, let's go. And uh, Ren refused to get on the boat. He was like, no. I'm not going like this is bullshit, whatever. So the boatman was like, okay. And he was, and I looked at her, I was like, he's not going to force you to get on. He's like, that's fine. So Karen went on her way into the afterlife, and that's kind of where the curtain closes, and the players don't really get to see what happens to their character's souls beyond that point. And Ryan literally just chose to stay in essentially what is purgatory. And I was like, how long are you going to wait there for? Because he'll come back whenever you're ready. He will take you. And she was like, I don't know, like, I'll, I'll think about it. And I was like, well, you're in a place where time is essentially meaningless. So you can think about it between anywhere between six seconds and a million years. It doesn't really make a difference to the boatman. He will come back whenever you're ready. So that was kind of how their characters wrapped up. Fragile little innocent Tim. Um, the player was kind of upset about what happened too. But his character, of course, was bawling his eyes. Out, very upset. He was crying out to uh, Paylor. Just saying like, you know praying for their souls to be looked after and everything and it was at this point where Felden the paladin decided it was time for him to tell Tim what he knew about Paylor. He just took Tim aside basically said you need to pick another god to pray to because Paylor is not listening. Of course Tim said like how can you say that you're supposed to be a paladin of Paylor what do you mean and Felden was just like Paylor is dead and then just laid it all out on the table and explained how during the Deck of Many Things situation, he learned a cosmic secret, and that secret was that Paylor is in fact deceased. He laid all this out for Tim, and of course this devastated Tim even more, and he's like, I need to tell my family, I need to tell the people of my village who still worship Paylor, like, religiously. Literally, 
and he was like, no, you can't tell anyone, you have to keep this to yourself, because the idea of Paylor existing in this world is more important than the truth that he is in fact dead. And I thought that was great, it was such a good roleplay moment, and then John, the guy who plays Felden, explained how the reason he switched to Oath of Vengeance from Oath of the Crown and was now worshipping a god of vengeance was because he found out that Paylor was dead and he's seeking to essentially avenge Paylor. So that was very sad. Um, Tim now was completely lost. Everything he thought he knew was a complete lie. And that also raised the question, where does he get his magic from then? Because clearly he's not a cleric of Paylor at 5th level if he's using that kind of magic from a dead god. So he just was like, I'm gonna pray to the woman that I've been seeing in my dreams recently because we've been doing this thing where when Tim falls asleep sometimes he's been dreaming of this lady wrapped in blue who's a, a river spirit because he's a druid and she's the one who's kind of granting him this power. So he had this whole like dialogue with her and she basically kind of explained to him more directly instead of through just visions and stuff. She literally appeared to him. Um, it's still in a dream, but not in a dream-like sequence. Like, they were just conversing, basically. And she explained that um, he was drawing his power from nature and that because of his kind heart and nature, that was why she had basically chosen him. Because he was one of the few who would stop and listen to what was around him instead of just being loud and not having any time for what little nature was left in this dying world basically so tim came to the revelation i mean again the player already knew this the whole time but tim the character realized that he was in fact a druid which in this world is something extremely rare there are maybe a dozen druids across the entire world and he is in fact one of them so that was kind of neat um lots of really excellent role play moments there from the party as well and now we are starting up a New start, essentially, the two of the characters, or two of the players, sorry, are making new characters completely, and the rest of the party is getting ready to start on the next chapter of this adventure, and that was really the final thing that was going to happen in this first arc, so to speak, of the campaign. And now the road to Barum and the trip there has forever become infamous. This is one of those things that I feel like we're going to be talking about for a while. That time where we just tried to get to Barum and two of our party members died and we fought like a million things along the way. And that is really a true example of how a random encounter, even one that was going to be tough but survivable, just because of some bad dice rolls and some unfortunate circumstance, ended up becoming extremely deadly and became a defining moment for this campaign. So that's where I'm going to end it because there's literally nothing else to talk about in another four weeks I'll have two games worth of content to talk about so we'll do another campaign diary then um hopefully you found this somewhat coherent and uh we're able to pull something out of this video because I again do enjoy talking about my games so I'm glad you guys like hearing about it um I guess we'll see what happens in the next one I'm excited to see where this campaign goes there's lots of really neat plot points that we're going to get into which I won't say too much about yet because who knows how that will unfurl but we're basically going to start getting into the meat of this campaign on our next session, which is this coming up Saturday, which I'm very excited about. So leave a comment and tell me what you think. Tell me if you've had any terrible, tragic character deaths in your games or if you've killed any of your players and felt bad about it, because I know I really felt bad about this one. And I guess until the next campaign diary, that is going to be it for this story thus far. Once again, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. And I will see you in the next video.